We're back in the book of Philippians this morning, so if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to stand as we read our text together uh, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. Uh, We're going to cover only primarily verses 19 through 21 today, but we're going to read the entirety of our text, Philippians chapter 1, 19 through 26, in a message entitled, As Long as God Gets the Glory, Part 1. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see your glory and your good and your plan and purpose, even in the most dire of times, because you are faithful, even when we are not. And you allow challenges in our life, but you don't do it to hurt us. You do it to refine us. And so I pray, Lord, that our heart would be one that can say, as long as you get the glory, Lord, you can do whatever you wish. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. For the last two weeks, um, we actually spent a lot of time looking at Paul and how uh, he was able to remain joyful even though um, there were some very challenging times in ministry. And we talked about some of those challenging times. Anybody ever been challenged as you served the Lord? Yeah, yeah, that, that's like a redundant question, right? But, but just so we can compare it, you know, because sometimes, you know how you go, man, my life is hard. And then you come across somebody else and you go, yeah, not that much. You know, uh, I, I want us to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because we're going to look at what Paul's life, and, and, and this was his summary of how he summed up his life. And I'm like, man, talk about a list. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Paul speaking says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. And then he comes up with this list. In labors more abundant, in stripes, which is a biblical word for whippings, above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I have been floating in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of cities, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, and in cold and nakedness. And besides the other things, and in order, so he, he kind of caps it off, that that's actually the easy part. What comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all of the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? For if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under uh, Aretas, the king, uh, was guarding the city of Damascus with a garrison desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped by his hands. Paul sums up his life as a bunch of things that should kill people. But by God's grace, he was alive. If we think about it, from the moment we're born, we're actually starting to die. Life is on a decrease. For those of you who are, but my friend, when I turned 40 years old, he called me up and he goes, man, happy 40th birthday. And, and he said, uh, starting tomorrow, you can start taking marbles out of the jar. And I'm like, what? 
He said, because the Bible says that a man's days are but 70 years and maybe 80 with the Lord's blessing. And so uh, because you're halfway done, instead of putting marbles in, now you're going to start taking them out. I'm like, right on, jerk. You know, you know what kind of guy does that? But, what, but the longer we live, there are pleasantries in life, but we understand the truth that life is hard, especially if we want to do it God's way. And so Paul is someone who understood the hardness of life, and yet he was joyful. How? Because I'm reading this like you, and I'm like, man, Lord, sometimes I don't feel it. I understand what you've allowed, but what I'm going through is just too deep, too hurtful, too hard. And, and, and there's no joy in the heart. So how do we look at life in a way that can give God glory? And I would argue it's by having proper focus or perspective. And so today what I wanted to do is break down five truths within verses 19 through 21 that share with us Paul's heart and what helped him keep his focus in the right place. And maybe we can use these as a checklist. And if we aren't doing these, we can then live these and see what the Lord will do. Amen? Amen. Let's go back to uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. The idea that we're going to learn today is to die is gain. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that is nothing I sh in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We, how many of you have memorized that, especially that last part of that verse? Now, how many of us actually believe it? Because that, that's a different story, right? When, we, when, we, when we, we can recite it, we can go, oh yeah, I know where that is. But to actually believe it down in the depths of our heart and soul, that's a whole different thing. Paul mentions five reasons why he could face even death, if need be, without fear. Now, when I read this, I'm like, man, I need this. Because I don't know about you, but there are some things that rock my world that is just too heavy for me to deal with at times. So I'm like, okay, how is it that this man of God, who was a former blasphemer, got radically saved and transformed to a point where he could say, you know what, even if for me to die... Uh, sorry, uh, to die, uh, for, uh, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. In other words, I can live for him or I can die for him. And if we're honest, I know a lot of people will go, yeah, you know what? I'm willing to die for the Lord. How many of you would raise your hand and say that? I, I, I'm gonna answer that question because those people had better live for the Lord. Because it's real easy to say, I would die for someone but it would be obvious if we would die for someone by looking at if we would live for someone. And that is what Paul is going to exemplify today. He focused on five things, the promises of the Lord, the prayers of the saints, the power of the spirit, the person of Christ, and the plan of God. All Ps, uh, I got my acronym from uh, reading through some of the commentaries, and uh, I thought this was a great place to start. So we're going to dive in here in Philippians 119a, focusing on the promises of the Lord. He says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul knew the scriptures, and because of that, he knew something. The more we know, the more we know. In other words, the more we know what God's word is saying, the more we know what his heart is. True? So I would argue if we don't know how to deal with the situation, it's because we don't know how to deal with the situation. It starts with going back to his word. The word know is oida in the Greek, which means to know or to be absolutely convinced. I am absolutely convinced in certain things in life. I don't know how I'm going to die. But I know this, when I die, I'm going home to be with Jesus. You don't need to persuade me. You don't need to convince me. I don't need to think about it. I know it. Because the Bible has said it and I believe it. And it doesn't even matter if I believe it. All that matters is if the Bible has said it and declared it. So I know that to be true for the person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. We go home to be with the Lord. What? he knew was that this present suffering that he was going through was ultimately going to work out for his, in this 
text, it uses the word deliverance or according to some versions, the word salvation. What do you mean? Well, Philippians 1.19, if you read it from the King James Version, anybody in here have the King James Version? So if you read it, it says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. So the idea is that deliverance and salvation are used synonymously within this text. Why do we need to know that? Because if we're not careful, we're gonna miss something really important. What Paul was doing was not just rambling a sentence. He actually was quoting something from the Old Testament. How do we know? Job 3.16. Uh, what he was doing was he was quoting the Septuagint. For those of you who are the what? The Septuagint is the old the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So he was quoting from that because he was a scholar. He was a Hebrew scholar. And it was Job's reply to Zophar. It says in Job 3.13.16, he, God, also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. In other words, this was when Job had lost everything, and his friends were like, you know what, Job, why don't you just acknowledge that you're a sinner and it's probably your own fault? And he was in the rubbish. And, and, and he utters these words that he shall be my salvation, or as it's translated in the New Testament, my deliverance. I don't know everything but I know that God will deliver me even from this. Amen? Amen? I had to learn this. What do I mean? And I've shared this before, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth, but two and a half years ago, almost three years ago now, my mom went in for a radical spine surgery and they didn't know if she was gonna make it through that. And then we lost our dog, which to most people is like, it's a dog, but she, we had her for 19 and a half years. She was a part of our family. And then... Within a month after that, they told April, we think your cancer came back. And the bottom just fell out of my world. And I, in my mind, went through all of the counselings I did with people when I would say stuff like, you just got to trust God. You just got to believe. You just got to walk by faith. And you got to read his word, dive into it, let it get into you, and you got to live it. And for some of you in here, I told you that. Until you hit this point in your life when you can't, then what? Right? Then what? And I realized in this deep moment that I was more like Job's friends than like Job. That I was real quick to say, hey, you know what? Why don't you just acknowledge your issues and move on than to say, you know what? I understand what it is to feel the depths. And, and so God... I believe, told me, you know what? I'm gonna let you feel it. I'm gonna allow this. And it was brutal and devastating and I pray that nobody has to go there. Yet, I know that some people have gone there because as the pastor, in even a distant way, I've walked with some of you through these. And so not only do I live it, but then I live it with you and you live it with me and we live this life that's full of these ideas this suffering. What's interesting though, is if we back up one verse in Job 13, 15, he says this before he acknowledges that God is his salvation. He says, though he slay me, I will trust him. You want to talk about power? Even if God were to take me out, I would trust him even with that. That's a pretty heavy, bold statement. How many of you can't wait for the rapture? Me, me, me neither, because I want out of this place, right? You know, but my friend, uh, I was talking to my friend one day, and, and you, you know how you, when you get old, you talk about these serious things? <laughs> so we're, ta we're talking about serious things, and he goes, yeah, I actually hope I die before the rapture. And I'm like, right on, freak. Why, 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 do, you, why do you say that? He says, because Paul talked about being able to know Christ and his sufferings even in his death. He goes, I want to know what it is to actually die so I know what Jesus went through when he died. <laughs> and and, and it, it hit me again how selfish I am. Because if I'm honest, part of my reason for wanting to get raptured is I don't want to deal with death. Paul's heart here is saying, God can be with us in all of it. Even if it meant the worst, though he slay me, I will trust him. So like Job, 
Paul fully believed that God would one day deliver him, both from his physical afflictions as well as uh, from false accusations. In fact, uh, in Romans uh, chapter 8, he utters the phrase that we often have all memorized. We all know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to the purpose, uh, his purpose. And some of us will think, well, it doesn't feel good right now. So, so how is it that he knows this? What does work together for good and deliverance have to do with it? Well, the word deliverance is the word soteria in the Greek. It means salvation. And in fact, we get our word soteriology when you go to Bible college, which is the doctrine or study of biblical salvation. So that's where this word comes from. In other words, I can not only see things from the physical perspective, but I will begin to see them from the spiritual perspective. And God will show me that even in this, he is in the process of saving me. Now, some commentators believe Paul was referring to del his deliverance from sin and ultimately death, uh, which was through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, he was talking about that I will be delivered from this bad situation that I'm in. Uh, others, uh, well, uh, well, I mean, uh, sorry, spiritual situation. You know, that he was a sinner and he needs to be delivered. Others argue that it was because of his imprisonment, that he was going to be delivered from prison. So some people will say, well, actually, he was talking about his deliverance being cleared from prison. So which is it? How do we know if he's talking about the spiritual or the physical? Because uh, how many of you know spiritually we're delivered and we're going to go home and be with the Lord? But we still pray for the physical deliverance as well. So how do we know? Well, in order to get the answer, all we got to do is look at br uh, briefly again at verse 20 which says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Because verse 20 qualifies his statement in verse 19 by using the expression, whether by life or by death, we know that it has to be the first thought because death is not going to deliver him out of prison although it would deliver him from prison in one sense. I mean, his body would leave, but he, his person would not leave. Everybody understand? So we know that he has to be speaking of the spiritual side. So in short, what Paul knew was that his present circumstances were temporary. And one day he was going to be with Jesus. So if we're going through the dire times, we cannot forget that this is just temporary that eventually we will be with Jesus. Amen? And so we hang our hats on that. And, and, and to quote Job again, Job 19, 25 to 26, probably one of my favorites. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I shall see God. I don't think that. I don't hope that. I know that. And the more we know it, the better off will be. Second point that he makes in verse 119b. He uses the expression through your prayer. One of the thing that kept, things that kept him going was his focus on the prayers of the believers or the saints. Um, isn't it good to know that people are praying for you? It's kind of funny. Every once in a while, I'll get an email or a text from someone who would just say something along the lines of, uh, I've been praying for you today for this, this, and this. Just wanted you to know that you're covered in prayer and I've been praying for you. I cannot tell you how many times those little things push you through. The little phone call, the little texts. I got you, I've been thinking of you, I'm praying for you. When we know that other people are doing that, it gives us this ability to hang in there. And if we're honest, when we go through rough times, usually those things become fewer and fewer. You know why? Because as people, we don't know how to deal with if we're experiencing good and someone's experiencing bad. How do we go and be amongst them and try not to be happy? You know what I mean? It's this weird thing. I remember when April was first diagnosed with cancer. And I'm not saying this in a mean way. And I'm, I'm excluding people from this church because you guys saw us every week. We came, we, I, to the best of my knowledge, minus the day of her surgery, we did not miss a single service here. There was a couple times I couldn't teach because I was so bust up. I asked other people to teach for me, but we came to every church service. So I'm not including anyone in this church. 
However, I could probably count on one hand, maybe two, in the six months that she went through surgeries and chemo and radiation, how many people came by to visit. In fact, I had to kick my mom out of the house a couple times because they would come by and they would cry and they would be a wreck. And, and, and everything was, they didn't know how to handle it. They didn't know how to deal. And so I'm not saying that that's bad, that's life. There are some people like that. But I will say, we had uh, uh, two boys, I'm not gonna name them, that April was their teacher from school. They were in, I believe, seventh and fifth grade at the time that this went down, or maybe even younger than that. And they told their dad, can you please drive us over to her house? We want to visit her and pray with her. We will never forget that day. Never. Just knowing that somebody was out there thinking of you and praying for you gave you enough strength to hang in there for a little while longer. Amen. I would encourage us to not only pray for people, but then to let people know we're praying for them. Because we don't know how close to the end of their rope they are. Let, let's not only, like I said, know it, but live it. Uh, James 5.16 says the effective prayer, of, uh, sorry, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails or accomplishes much. So Paul was not only diligent to pray for himself, but he prayed for other people and other people prayed for him. In fact, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, uh, go there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 1, 5. It says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. In other words, as we suffer and each, we know that each other is suffering, we can get through this together. 2 Corinthians 1, go to verse 8, drop down a little bit. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to, you, uh, to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we were despaired even to life. In other words, we were in the pit. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from, such, uh, fr from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. And then look at what it adds. And you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. In other words, we want to give God credit and thanks for sustaining us. But we also want to give you credit and thanks for praying for us and sustaining us. So if I haven't said this in a while, I personally thank all of you who pray for me and my bride. We need it. But the pastor often gets prayed for a lot. And I appreciate your prayers. But we all need it. We all could be there for one another. And so therefore, as you have opportunity and as you remember, April and I love to put pictures on our refrigerator because we can see faces of people and such. And as you see faces, it reminds you to pray for people and whatnot. So remember to, as much as possible, not only be mindful of people, but pray for them. And then if you do, call them and let them know you're thinking of them and praying for them. It don't gotta be something long and weird. Just, just, just a little, you know what, I'm thinking of you today. And once again, who knows how much blessing that will bring. Hmm. Third thing he mentions in Philippians 1.19c. He talks about the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was focused on the spirit's power. So far, Paul said he knew the word of God. He gave thanks for the prayers of the saints. And now he gives thanks for the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had promised to send the Holy Spirit when he was on earth. According to John 14, 16 through 17, he prayed, and I will pray the Father that he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you, how long? Forever, which is why I believe a Christian cannot lose their salvation. Once the Holy Spirit comes into you, he is in you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So there will be this in, 
uh, embodying of the Holy Spirit in our lives. According to John 15 then, it mentions him once again as the helper. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And we have actually several passages that say the Holy Spirit is our helper, he is our teacher, he is our protector, so forth. So Paul uses this word supply. Anybody have uh, supplies that you need in case of emergency? I would say make sure you have the Holy Spirit tucked into that supply bag. What I mean is this. We often look for physical, you, you know, your hurricane preparedness kit, right? You know, you want to make sure you have water, right? That's number one. Your Costco, you see people buying like 400 cases. You know, so water. What else? Batteries. Batteries. Canned food, ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> so that you can eat real quick when the power goes out. Yeah. <laughs> if you ask, if I went into a church and I said, what do you need for your hurricane prepared kit? I would argue that hardly anybody would go than the Holy Spirit. But that's exactly what we need. Yes, we may need the other things, but we cannot forget that he is the one who is able to sustain. He is our, this word supply, which means help aid, support, provisions. What Paul knew was that the Holy Spirit would help him. He would support him. He would provide all that he needed and nothing would be lacking. Just some examples. The Holy Spirit provides guidance when we do not know what to say. According to Matthew chapter 10, it talks about uh, in verse 19 and 20, when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given you in the hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the father, a spirit of your father who speaks in you. So in other words, if we want to go and share with people, we don't got to worry and map out exactly what we're going to say because God is going to deliver it to us what it is we need to say when we need to say it. Amen? Uh, also, the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray. And I'm not going to ask how many here feel that prayer is a struggle. Because if we're honest, we go, oh, yeah, okay, we can pray for a little bit. You know, and, and, and we're like, okay, I'm going to pray. And then like within two minutes, you look at your watch, you know. And, and anybody? So I know I'm, the, the idea is that we, we can pray. Just turn it all off. Get away from things. Put the phone aside. Set aside some time. And then you go, but I, I, I'm going to run out of things to pray. That's actually not true biblically. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us, intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So even when we don't know what to pray, he's gonna pray. And just so we can be clear, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, this is absolutely not the gift of tongues. Absolutely not. The word groanings is a different word than the word tongues. So hear me clear, I'm not saying that there is no gift of tongues. What I am saying is that this is not that. It, it, it's something that is different. In other words, how many of you, and if you look up this word groaning, it means to exhale or to sigh. How many of you have prayed and you just kind of, you hit this point where, <sighs> God even understands that. And, and that's the Holy Spirit allowing us to just exhale and know that God knows it. Um, so he also is God's source of power, according to Acts 1.8, um, that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So once again, we could focus, how am I going to get through this? Well, the Holy Spirit resides in me and he is all powerful so he can get me through this. Amen. Fourth thing he mentions is he focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.28. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body. Notice that the earnest expectation and hope was in Jesus. In other words, whatever Jesus wants, he is going to work it out. He will be magnified in my life. Even, and he's going to go into next, even if it means death. Because I will tell you some of the most profound things I have ever learned and seen in my life have been right before people have entered eternity. And, and it may not seem to the person who's leaving that what they're saying is powerful. 
But let's face it. Everybody wants to know exactly what that person who's going to meet Jesus is saying right before they meet Jesus. Amen? And so the idea is that we can understand this. He was certain that he would never be put to shame. He was certain that he would be vindicated. He knew that his body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, he lived like it. Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So once again, now that he knew it, he lived it. It wasn't just knowing it in his mind. He actually manifested it. And since Jesus is in us and we are in him, this should come naturally. 2 Corinthians 4.10 says, We always carry about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. In other words, because I have Jesus in me, I am reminded he died for me. And because I am reminded that he died for me, I am reminded that I need to die, for my, uh, die to myself. And because he lives in me, I am reminded that I need to live in him. Amen? And so therefore, the more we think about Jesus, the more we go, I can do this. And I can pick it up and we can go on. Last thing he focused on, and I want to spend a little bit of time here and then we'll wrap this up, is verse 20b to 21, where he says, whether by life or by death, and then he, verse 21, which we all have memorized, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If we struggle with understanding the exact plan of God for our lives, anybody in here don't know exactly what God has for you? I know generally, but I don't know the exact things because things still catch me by surprise. Anybody? Okay, so, so if we struggle with that, understand this, Paul did too. And so if one of the greatest people who ever lived, an apostle who Jesus appeared to himself, struggled with understanding God's perfect plan into the future. I'm in great company when I don't understand it all. He was not certain what God's plan was for him. Whether he would continue, right? Because that's what he said. I don't know whether I'm going to live on in the body or I'm going to die and go home and be with the Lord. I don't know. I, I, I really don't have all the answers. But either way, the Lord's will was going to be done and his plan would be beautifully and fully accomplished. And he was confident in that. He resolved that he would bring God glory even in his life and in his death. Just some verses. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. It says, Paul speaking, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with what? Joy. Going back, this is how he had joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. If we were to go to Acts 21, 13, it says, Paul answered and said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Why are you freaking out that this is happening to me? Can't you see the good that's coming of it? Talk about a perspective. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 through 9. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, lived, uh, sorry, and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. How many of you are alive? Live for the Lord. How many of you are dead? You don't got to worry about that, right? But the idea is when you're dying, we still die to the Lord. We, we do so in a way that brings him glory and ultimately he, he empowers that. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says to Timothy, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Talk about a perspective. Therefore, I go back to what I said at the beginning. We need to be willing to die for God, but we need to be equally as willing to live for God. And the problem that a lot of us face is the reason that we struggle in the tough times is we know that someday we're going to die for God, but we haven't really fully lived for God. 
And I would challenge us to take some of these five perspectives and apply them, not only so that we know them in our minds, but so that we're living them. And just so I can be clear, I found this super interesting. For, uh, the, uh, verse 20, where, uh, sorry, 21, where it says, for to, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the Greek, because yes, I'm one of those people who go look up stuff in dictionaries. In the Greek, there actually is no verb in this sentence. What it reads literally in Greek is this. To live Christ, to die gain. To live Christ, to die gain. So I'm going to spin that into a question and it'll sum up the whole study. Have we lived Christ? If the answer to that is yes, to die gain. Are we living Christ? And if yes, then even death is gain. That is the perspective that Paul wanted his hearers to have. And I believe the perspective that we as believers should have. I'm going to end with a quote by John MacArthur. He said, The apostle's very being was wrapped up in his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He trusted, loved, served, witnessed for, and in every way was devoted to him and dependent on him. His only hope, his only purpose, his only reason to live was Jesus. He traveled for Christ. He preached for Christ. He was persecuted and imprisoned for Christ. Ultimately, he was going to die for Christ. But even death by God's marvelous grace, a grace was ultimately for Paul's eternal gain. It's all a matter of perspective. I end with the question, are we living Christ than to die gain? Hey everyone, Frank Figueroa here. Thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to see more content like this, check out one of these videos. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel and visit our website. Adios and aloha.